Please join me in welcoming David Lyon. Good evening. Um, so this is really exciting for me. I'm David and with Open ROV, and I was so excited to get this invitation to come speak at the library because I actually wrote a good chunk of the book here. I used to live down the street and was found this to be a really productive place to come and, and get some writing done. I would go work at tech shop down the street and then come here and write about everything I learned. So um, it's, a, it's a real privilege to be here. And I want to talk about a few things um, about making, but I've also learned a few things. So the book came out three months ago, and I've been around kind of talking to different people about their projects and, and you know, what they're working on and, and how they can get involved. Um, and, and I want to broaden it to, to more than just making and really make this, this talk about, about dreaming and about friendship because that's really what the, my story has, has been and um, I think it's an important component to what this whole maker movement really is. And I, w I want to start with, the, with this quote from Kanye West who I think is totally crazy but I really like this quote that I read from him in the New York Times about, um, about dreaming properly. And it just kind of jumped off the page. Before I get started, I just want to get a quick show of hands. How many people have heard of the maker movement? OK, so everybody. How many people have been to a maker fair? OK, so only about half. So that's great. That means you all have this kind of opportunity coming up here in May of this year to go and attend a maker fair and really see what this this whole thing is about. And that's what happened to me four years ago now. I had, someone told me, he said, have you ever heard of Maker Fair? And I said, no, I don't know what it is. They said, well, you've got to go, and you've got to check it out. And so I did. Um, I showed up at this Maker Fair, and I think it was, it must have been 2009 now. Um, and I was completely blown away. I mean, there were you know, this huge crowd of people you know, building all sorts of things that I never could have imagined, robots and 3D printers and um, working with electronics, and it was just, the whole scene to me was bizarre. It was out of this world, and, and I was captivated. And the thing that, that really grabbed my attention was the people. Um, you know, regardless of all these cool things that they were making, I was most impressed by how passionate they were and how excited they were about what they were doing. I, I just, I knew I wanted that. At the time, I was working in an office, and I had a job where I was writing a lot of emails and, and you know, thought it was important and, and doing all these things, but I knew I wanted to have that passion that I saw that these, these makers had. And um, so I, I didn't know what to do, but I, but I kind of left that event thinking, okay, somehow I gotta get involved in that. And it wasn't until I met um, this guy, this is a photo um, taken a little bit later. This is Eric Stackpole, he's my, one of my best friends and, and um, co-conspirator at Open ROV. He's, uh, he, this is the kind of guy he is. I always like to use this photo because he went to Antarctica last year and he was packing a tuxedo. I was like, why are you packing a tuxedo? And he's like, D just trust me. And it, just so he could take this photo. And this is exactly the type of guy he is. He's just really, really thoughtful, adventurous. Um, and I met him three years ago, almost to this day, exactly. And we met at a, at a hostel in, in Fort Mason. A mutual friend said, you know, you got to meet this guy. I think you'll really like him. He's building a submarine in his garage. I said, that sounds bizarre. You know, I have to, I have to meet him. And, and we got introduced, and um, he started telling me this story about this underwater cave that had this, supposedly had gold at the bottom of this underwater cave in Northern California. And there was this gold, gold rush era robbery, and this gold was thrown down the cave, and no one had been to the bottom of it. And that's why he was building this underwater robot to go explore. And he pulled this out and showed it to me. And this was in the first hour of us talking, and I, my jaw was on the floor, and I just knew that I wanted to be a part of that. I mean, this was that same feeling that I had seen at Maker Faire, and that same thing that was missing from my life at the time. And so I said, Eric, you've got to let me take along. Uh, I want to help you build this robot. I want to go to this cave. I want to, you know, I want, to be, I want to be a part of it. And he was like, okay, great. Sounds good. And so what we did was, we, we, that robot never worked. It was a, an early prototype that never never functioned. It was kind of a symbol of where we were going. But he, um, he let me create a website. We called it Open ROV. And I said, I think we should make this thing open source and invite other people on the internet to help us get to our goal, to help us make this robot, and see if we can make this you know, a bigger thing than just, just about us. So we did. We created this website called Open ROV. And what it is is just a forum. And I talk about in the book all the different platforms that you can easily get started and create one of these things. 
And the, the barriers to, to getting these things going are so low. It's really, what it really is is just starting, starting a discussion. And that's what happened at that hostel when Eric and I first met, is we shared our dream of having really low cost underwater robots and being able to explore for ourselves. We started dreaming together. Um, and that was important. And also this stage when we had these forums was really important, because it was just Eric and I at the beginning. But, but steadily, we began to, to meet more people who were interested, people who had different advice. And we'd always invite them to our website to contribute ideas and, and concepts and, and maybe other adventure ideas. We just invited people to be a part of this dream. Um, and so we kept doing it. And for many, many months, it was just, just us on the forums, no big deal. But then we mounted this expedition to go back to the cave. We finally had a robot to the point where we, we could go and we could do this. And um, we were so excited. I mean, it was just us and a few friends. But we, did get the, we ended up getting the interest of the New York Times. Um, and the New York Times wrote a story about it. And all of a sudden, it, was, it exploded. We, got, we started getting emails and messages from people all over the world who said, that l robot looks really cool. I want to get one. You know, how can I get one? How can I build my own? And we had been publishing all the designs online, um, but we decided to, to run a Kickstarter project. And we thought, OK, well, we'll offer these, these kits for the, of the robot um, and, and put it on Kickstarter and see if anyone wants one. And we set our funding goal at $20,000. We thought, yeah, if we get $20,000, that would be a big success. Then we can you know, get a, a number of these kits out there. And we raised the $20,000 in like two hours. So we pressed, you, know, you press Submit on your project. And then it goes on the internet, and all of a sudden, you see the dollar signs going up. And it's, at first, you're really excited. You know, it's thrilling. And then it keeps going up. And then you realize, oh, man, we really got to make all of these things. Um, so we, uh, we ended up raising $111,000, which a year and a half ago was a lot of money on Kickstarter. Nowadays, it's like run of the mill. A lot of projects raise that much money. It's not as not as impressive, but for us, that was a lot. I mean, we were working out of Eric's garage at the time. We were working at, out of tech shop. Um, I was living in my car. I mean, that was, that was a significant deal. Um, and then Eric was going to Antarctica. So he had another job working on um, ROVs at the time. He had worked out. But he, anyways, he had to go to Antarctica. And so I was left to make all these things. And that was so daunting. It was one of the loneliest most difficult moments of my life is getting all of these boxes of parts and trying to manage where the, all these th things are coming from from all over the world, and then turning around and then shipping these out to our Kickstarter backers. And luckily, we, had this, we have had this great community of people who've been really supportive, and we did get these things together. A lot of the community ended up showing up, helping me pack boxes, helping me make robots, and getting them out the door. So we figured it out. And we started shipping these things around the world, and now they've been to all these different corners of the globe. And, and it's so exciting to, to get these pictures back. But more importantly, it's exciting to meet all these other people. You know, We feel so privileged to be a part of this, to be a part of this community of, of ocean explorers, of, of people who are curious, you know, who have different shipwrecks or meteorites or sunken ships or whatever. They have these wild stories, and they're going to go out, and they're going to try and find them. And for us, it's just so fun to be a part of. So you know, we're not getting rich. We're not the richest um, ocean little mini sub builders in the world, but we are having the most fun. And the people who contribute to our community are are getting a lot out of the process because it's not just a product. You know, you get this kit, and you're also a part of this community of people who are building this infrastructure. You know, nothing like this has really ever existed um, for ocean exploration, and we're doing it. You know, it's a network of garage enthusiasts putting this thing together. And this is the latest one. So the robot is moving so fast. The development is, is really moving along. The software is coming along really well. A lot of the different hardware components. This is the latest, version 2.5. It's something that's fun to look at and to play with, but it also is fun because of what it stands for. And it stands for the thousands of people who have taken the time to, to be a part of it. OK, so that has all happened in the span of like two years. Um, I went from, from not having a job to living in my car to all of a sudden you know, working on this robot company and you know, having this community of DIY ocean explorers who I'm, who I'm a part of. Uh, that's, a big, that's a big jump. Um, and so what did I learn? And I wrote, 
I started writing about this, this for Make Magazine, and, and the first thing I learned is that this is not about DIY. I mean, when you first get into this, you think, wow, these makers are, are really gifted people. They know a lot of things that I don't know. They could build these things in their garage. Um, they have a lot of skills and knowledge. But I, I didn't have that. I was a, kind of a, a desk jockey. And I, I learned very quickly that this isn't about doing anything yourself. This is about being open to doing things with other people. It's about getting advice. It's about sharing ideas. Um, you know, helping people when you can and having people help you when they can. So that's a big, important idea. It's about do it together, DIT. The other thing I learned is that these are not my grandfather's tools. You know, I figured this was something where, you know, if I wanted to start making, I would have to, you know, either go back to school and get an engineering degree, or maybe I would have to, you know, be a computer scientist or all these different things. Uh, what I found was that these tools, these mostly computer-controlled machines, so CNC machines, like 3D printers are something you hear a lot about. Um, laser cutters are another exceptional tool. Um, CNC mill machines. These things are all very accessible. I mean, they're at Noisebridge, which is a, a hackerspace in the mission. You guys can all go there on, I think Wednesday nights is their open house. Um, and you can go there and you can learn how to use these machines. You can go to Tech Shop, also down the street. Um, learn how to use these tools. These things are really becoming accessible. And you could take a two-hour class, a three-hour class, and learn enough to be dangerous. Um, and that's, that's the one thing I picked up quickly is you're never going to learn everything. You're not going to learn how to use all these tools. But that shouldn't stop you from getting started. That once you kind of have seen what's possible inside the shop, you see what these different tools can do, then you, then you know what's possible. And you kind of learn it as you need to. And you, you figure out which people to talk to. Because the other people have the, the information. They have the, the technique. They can help you get things done. So it's kind of this idea of, of just-in-time learning is something that Neil Gershenfeld talked about. And from the very beginning, I only wanted to learn. I didn't want to learn everything. I just wanted to learn enough to be dangerous. And I think that's a really important idea, is that a little bit of knowledge goes a long way in opening up all these new possibilities. Really, you can, you can kind of chart this new trajectory uh, for, for your life, really. And, and now is a perfect time to get involved because the, the tools are still kind of nascent and the, and the communities are just forming and just coming together. The opportunity is really, it's, it's wonderful right now. It's a, it's a really opportune time to jump in. Um, and this, someone had this chart when I was getting started and showed it to me and I thought it was really important. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of stuff that, that you just don't know and even more stuff that you don't know you don't know. And, and learning enough to be dangerous is really about expanding that yellow circle. It's about expanding the stuff you, that, you, that you, under, you know it's out there, but you don't know how to do it. Um, just kind of broadening your world of what, what's possible. And so I had all this advice that I had been writing down of all these things I was learning. And I decided that I wanted to you know, turn that thing into a little book, into a guide for someone else who was in my, maybe my position a few years ago, who was in this kind of office or in this job that they didn't like or, or have this idea that they want to get into the world, but didn't know where to start, that this whole thing seemed too intimidating. So I thought I, I'd put it together in a, in a little guidebook, and that's what I did. I, I, I put the project, again, on Kickstarter. I said, oh, I want to create this book. And uh, you know, several people got behind it, and I was, then I had to write the book, which, again, you shouldn't put yourself in those kind of positions. But I did, and it came out in September, and I'm really proud of, of it, and I'm proud of um, all, all the people who have participated in this and are excited to get their own projects into the world and are excited to participate in this maker movement because I think it's really important. You know, I think this, you know, I, I'd grown up in, in this world where, you know, there was television and ads and everything gets done for you. And uh, for me, this was a really important transition. This was kind of moving from this world where you're just kind of a passive consumer of things to an active participant, to a maker. And, and I think that's what this maker movement is really about. And I, I really hope that, that you guys are, are interested and excited to, you know, to make that first step, because it's really the, the most important thing. One, one other thing I wanted to add. I just got this email. So you, the thing about writing a book is you, you, unleash, you unleash your ideas in the world, and they're 
you know, they're the best ideas you have, but there's always criticism. And so I've gotten, you know, some feedback of people who have been, um, you know, some people have really liked it and some people have been critical. I got this email the other day and, and I wanted to address some of the, the criticism of the book because I think this is important because I think this is worth clarifying. Here were his three bones to pick with the book. One is, David, you joined a project that was already underway. Eric was already building this robot. Second thing was you live in the Bay Area. The Bay Area has a huge advantage over other places in the world. And then three, you became a maker with the support of Make Magazine, and all these people were reading your blog, your Zero to Maker blog. I thought all of these things are totally fair, but I also want to address them and say, I did join a project that was already underway, but there are so many projects that are underway. I mean, it's a big, you know, by deciding to become a part of this community, you can show up at these maker spaces and join any of these projects. You know, we welcome anyone to jump into the Open RV project and start sharing what they're doing online. We love that. I don't think you, you need to feel like you're starting from zero. You know, you shouldn't feel like you have to do this all yourself. You could be a part of some of these other projects. We're all standing on the shoulders of giants. There's all these people who've created these tools and, and created these pathways and opportunities for us. It's great to take advantage of those things. So that's what I think about that one. Second, you live in the Bay Area. All of you live in the Bay Area. You guys are all very privileged to be in this place because I, I do think there is something special about, um, about charting new ideas and making them happen here. But I do think this thing is spreading all over the world. And we're seeing this in our community. There's, there's people in every corner of the globe who are participating in our projects. And all of these open source hardware projects would tell you the same thing. Also, there's maker spaces popping up everywhere. There are local mini maker fairs that are springing up all over the place. There was just the 100th mini maker fair last weekend. There, it's, it's something that's spreading beyond the Bay Area. And it, if there isn't a maker movement in your, or a maker fair or a maker space in your community, you know, it's a great time to get your neighbors organized, get your friends organized, and start something like this. Um, and then the third thing is that I was privileged because I got to, to write for Make Magazine. And of course, I think that's true. I think it was a really big honor, and, and we were really lucky. But I also think that everybody has that opportunity. I mean, we're, Make Magazine loves writing about makers and the projects that they're doing. And I, I think it's important that if you see what's happening here, that you know that you, you also have the support of Make Magazine. You also have the support of the maker community. We all want you to, to start your own project. Nobody, no, if you have an idea in your head, a dream, we want, everybody wants to see that come to life. And I think that's important to, to keep in mind is that um, everyone's rooting for you. I'm, I'm happy to teach everything I've, I've learned. Um, most of all my best ideas are in the book. Um, but I think you'll find that with the maker movement is everybody is really supportive and encouraging of what, um, of what you can dream of and what you want to build. And then just to end on this, that a lot of people are probably wondering if we uh, found any gold in the cave. We didn't. <laughs> but I always like to end this is that we didn't find any gold, but we found this treasure, which was this community of people um, and this, this experience of, of sharing this, this dream with, with all these other folks. So uh, that's all. And if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer questions. Ideas are kind of cheap in a way because there's plenty of them, but sure. implementing the idea is a whole different story. Yeah. So how do you, when you, uh, f how do you filter the ideas? Is there a process? Because even your own ideas, uh, the first time maybe isn't the best thing. You need to sure. go through a process of filtering it and refining it and editing the idea. So yeah. what is that process about? I'll, I'll go back to the first slide. I think it's really, a, it's more about just having a good idea. It's about dreaming properly. You know, it's about having an idea that really comes from something that you want to see in the world. You know, I see a lot of people who say, oh, I think there's a big market for this. Then I'm going to go and create that. I think that there, I could sell 100,000 of X. I, those projects never, never work out because they don't have the right spirit. They don't have the right soul. I mean, the, the thing that, that you want, that you, just can't, that you can't live without, and nobody else makes it or it doesn't exist, that's the thing you should be making, even if it's just for you. Um, so starting with the, the, right, the right idea, which, which comes from something that you know, either solves like a big problem you're having or is just something you, you want, is, is, is the first step. 
And then it's about inviting people. It's about you know, finding the people around here and saying, hey, what do you think of this? It's about showing up at the, the local makerspace and saying, well, I have this idea. I've started you know, make, prototyping this way, but I don't know if that's going to work. You know, what do you think? And those are the, the four most powerful words in, in bringing an idea to life is what do you think? Like you, I guess, uh, joined the tech shop recently. Yeah. Want to get into some other stuff. And I'm a little daunted, you know, particularly yeah. about electronics. I sure. never built anything with logic circuits or computer control. And yeah, if you walk into tech shop or if you walk into a makerspace and it's filled with projects and it's filled with these electronics, and that is scary. There, there is a there is that barrier of fear, and I think everybody has it, and it's really, it's really natural. Um, you can you can learn it. You know, you, there is w with everything you learn, there is it is going to be work, no doubt about it. Um, I think the what I've found is that setting myself up in a position where I have to learn it, like saying, okay, we want to build this underwater robot, now we have to figure out this part of it. Um, putting kind of raising the stakes almost, and then inviting other people to be a part of it. So I'm still terrible with electronics, still terrible with programming. Um, you know, I, I don't think I'm a good maker, but what I, what I think is important is that um, f for me, it was just a willingness to be a part of something. And I think that's what we're finding is that, is that um, one is, is these things are approachable. The, the classes, the, the experts, they're all accessible online now. Um, but two, is, is the internet has kind of changed things where you can connect to people much quicker and, and kind of leverage what you do know to be a part of something that you, that you want to do, almost like trading your skills. It sort of sparked an idea. And I was curious if uh, there are groups of people thinking about um, cooperatives and applying the idea that you, know, you can have a bunch of potters who get together and they, mm -hmm. ma they make pottery together and then they sell the stuff they make in a, in a shared shop and each potter is a is an owner of the cooperative together, and it's easy for them to come and go. Are there people who are doing this in the maker movement, and also in the kind of the version that you have, where it's a you're actually trying to do this at scale? Yeah, um, you know, there's some things like that are cooperative like. One of the things that we're we're seeing is open source hardware, right? So people are are making hardware open source. Uh, our all of our design files are online. You can go and download them and make your own robot. That'd be wonderful. I'd love that. Um, so there, there's forms of that. I mean, sharing is rampant. I think there's a, I think there's a kind of a widespread realization that we need to rethink what value is. And because I don't have a lot of money, I live on a little sailboat now, and you know what? My life is just really rich because I have this huge community and I get to invite it on these adventures with them all over the world. And I talk about this a lot. This goes back to, to your question too. Is Eric and I, when we started this, we said, okay, you know, even though it's a business, we're, we're going to maximize our return on adventure. We're going to make sure we're having the most fun and that everybody who jumps in here is going to have a lot of fun. And, and I think that's important for us. And, and I think that new models will start to emerge. But I, I think it's really important to think about value. And regardless of whether you call yourself a nonprofit or a co-op or a, a business, those are all just like structural issues, I think that the, the real focus has to be on creating value. Do you think about something in terms of its hack, hackability? Yeah. Like before you buy it? Sure. And when you look at a product or things that you just, no, no, like your toaster breaks. I'm going to take apart my toaster. Sure. My washing machine. Like you didn't ever think about that before, but now you do. Yeah, there's, wow. totally. There's a section in the, in the book about fixing things. And I have to tell a little story about how my blender broke. And I just realized it was a totally cheap blender. And I fixed it, and I put it all, took it apart and put it back together. But, and it worked again. But um, I just realized, that, you know, like, you should have more valuable things. You know, you should, you should think about how things are, are made. And that's one thing I noticed with me. I mean, this was very early on, and I started this, is I started noticing how things are made. I started understanding and wondering how things were made and, and really kind of Getting, putting a mental, getting a mental picture of the manufacturing process and where all this stuff comes from. And 
Yeah, it's the provenance of things, the, the story of things, the soul of things. That all really, really matters. And I think like as a, as a culture, we need to wake up to that. That, that we're creating this world. We're, we're putting the meaning into things or not putting the meaning into things. And we need to decide what kind of world we want to live in. I hope it's a, I hope it's a meaningful one. You mentioned uh, there was a shop called the Tech Shop nearby that yeah. we could go and, and look at people doing this, uh, making these items. Yeah. Where could you, could you tell us more about that shop? Sure. Um, so the, there's a number of these physical spaces. So the maker movement is an idea, but it's also manifesting in these physical maker spaces around the world. And they take a lot of different forms. There's a number of different shapes and sizes here in the Bay Area. One of them is Tech Shop. Tech Shop is the most like commercial, it's like a fitness club, but they've got a bunch of tools. And it's, like a, it's, it's more expensive. It's like 100 bucks or something like that a month, but they have millions of dollars worth of tooling there. I mean, all the CNC machining, all the training, all these things that you can really, you can really prototype just about anything there. Um, there's other spaces in the Bay Area too, like um, NoiseBridge is a good example. It's a maker space. It's a, it's a cooperative model um, where you can just show up. You don't have to, you know, they're, they're kind of open and welcome, but they're, you know, it's a, it's a smaller, smaller community. What's that one again? It's called NoiseBridge. It's in the mission. So you mentioned that you went through a time where you uh, had lost your job and you were living in your car and yeah. kind of going through a transitional phase. Sure. And I'm in a similar position right now, and I was wondering if you could kind of share your insights about like uh, what kind of challenges that you faced or you yeah. know, how you managed living in the Bay Area kind of in a transitional period like that. Yeah. It's really hard. I, um, I'm like emotional thinking about it um, because when you lose your job or when you lose anything you find yourself questioning things you question like your value as a human what you're you know if, I, I just I vividly remember walking through the streets just going what am I gonna do and I and it was terrifying for a lot for a, a good amount of time, for months and months and months. I was really scared. And one day I had this idea, okay, well, what, if I, what do I really, really want to do? And I, and I had this idea, be a DIY industrial designer. And that's when I really schemed up this whole zero to maker thing. I was like, I don't have any money to do this, but I'm going to start you know, taking these classes and writing about it and doing all these things. And there was this glimmer of hope that maybe that's the right way to do it. Maybe there's a, a way there. And, and really positive things started to happen after I, after I made that commitment. And it was little things. It was um, showing up and woodworking one day, or just, just these small victories, you know, like, t so when, one day, you start with something, and then you finish it, and it's something else. You see the progress. It builds this kind of confidence that um, there's forward momentum. You know, I learned how to do this today, or I, I learned ab about this tool today. And um, those small victories were huge, were really important. And I just started stringing those together. And open ROV, I mean, it's it's. Great. I mean, it's cool to come up here and talk about this. Like, there's a book, and we have now we have a company and all these people, and it's wonderful. But it was not always like that. You know, it was there were moments where it was very, very bleak. Um, it's never been a better time to learn these tools. And if there's something you're interested in, just find someone who knows it and just hang around them. Hang around until they teach you. And and keep doing that until you've learned <laughs> several different things. And, and continue to, to dream big, because it's really, it's really possible. And, and really amazing things can happen if you, if you keep your head down straight and say, OK, this is an opportunity. This is, because you only get a few w w windows of, of time where you can change things in, in a big way. So that was really a long thing, but that means a lot to me. So you guys, thank you so much. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you.